Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this first session of the uh, summer school. Uh, just uh, for safety measures, I noticed that the safety exit is right here on my left, in case there is anything, but let's hope we won't have to use it. And if you can please mute your phones and other electronic devices, that would be great. My name is Mireille Goulet, and I'm with the Dog Legislation Council of Canada. Um, those of us who live and work with dogs believe that dogs are individuals. But what does science tell us about that? As a biologist myself, I do have a lot of interest to this topic. And uh, as many of us, I wonder what are the commonalities and the differences between our two species and that science can actually identify and confirm. In 1974, philosopher Thomas Nagel wrote the essay, What It's Like to Be a Bat, where he argued that we could not explain the, the thoughts and feelings of other species. Our first speaker argues differently based on his fascinating work. Gregory Burns is a neuroeconomist. He holds a university professorship in both psychiatry and economics. Dr. Burns holds a distinguished chair of neuroeconomics in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at the Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, where he directs the Center for Neuropolicy. Dr. Burns studies in, studied in physics at Princeton <laughs> University. He holds a PhD in biomechanical engineering and an MD in medicine at the University of California. His research uses functional magnetic resonance imaging to study canine cognitive function in awake and unrestrained dogs, to non-invasively map the perceptual and decision system of the dog's brains. Dr. Burns has written many papers and four books, two of which concern his presentation today. How Dogs Love Us, a neuroscientist and his adopted dog decode the canine brain, and what's it like to be a dog, and other adventures in animal neuroscience. Dr. Burns will give his presentation, and it will be followed by a Q&A. Dr. Burns? Merci. Uh, since my French is very bad, I'll be speaking in English. Uh, so it's great to be here and exciting to open uh, the course. So I'm here to talk about dogs and um, so we have quite a bit of time so I thought I would take my time and explain the background of what we call the Dog Project in Atlanta. Um, the title is a little bit different, uh, 100,000 Awake Dog MRIs, What Have We Learned? So. The idea here is the 100,000 MRIs refer very roughly to the number of MRIs that I think I've done of dogs over the past seven or so years. So the project started back in 2011, um, really as a side project. So prior to working in dogs, my background is in neuroscience and primarily uh, studying human decision making. Re, uh, specifically reward processing and decision making, uh, a field that's now known as neuroeconomics. Um, so it was really in 2011 where I just had the idea of whether I could train my own dog to go in an MRI scanner to see what she was thinking. Okay, so, um, so with that, uh, we'll begin. So just by way of orientation, um, what I plan to talk about is first cover the basics of why we're using MRI to study dogs, and then talk a fair bit about the philosophy and how we actually train dogs to go into the MRI. Um, as you'll see, it's, it's really quite different than historically animal research and how that has been done. So I have a very different uh, view of that. And then I'll talk about the different types of studies that we can use MRI for. And really it breaks down, um, that's interesting. Um, Sorry. 
No, something else flashed up on the screen. It's okay now. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so the idea is that we can use MRI to, to basically do three different types of, of MRI studies. As you see, uh, we break this down into passive tasks in which the dog doesn't have to do anything, so we simply show dogs things while they're in the scanner, and then we register responses from their brain in an effort to try to understand what they're processing and how their brains process the specific things that we show them. Um, this leads to kind of what we call hybrid tasks, uh, which is the same idea, except we may correlate what their brains are doing with specific behaviors outside the scanner. And then finally, the most difficult thing to study is to actually try to teach dogs to do something in the scanner so that we can study uh, their behavior and how their brain response relates to the behavior. But as you'll see, it's quite challenging because the overall constraint of doing MRI in anyone, dog or human, is they can't move. Uh, so there's a very small set of things that we can ask a dog to do without moving their head. Uh, but I'll give you ex one example of that. And then finally, if we have time, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the diseases that dogs get. Um, because this project is now going on its eighth year, uh, we are running into the dog's lifetime. And as many of the dogs have been participating through their lifetime, we're watching them develop the diseases that dogs get. And because they're all trained for MRI, it gives us a very unique opportunity to intervene and, and help them uh, in terms of health interventions before it becomes too late or bef before they actually show symptoms from their illnesses. So I'll talk about that at the end. Okay, so why do we MRI dogs? Well, there's several reasons for doing this. One is a, an evolutionary perspective that dogs give us. So dogs are, of course, the first animals to live with humans, and when that happened and where that happened um, is a matter of intense debate, but roughly we can say that uh, dogs began living with humans probably about 15,000 years ago, although it may be as long as 30,000 years ago. It's, it's a matter of debate whether dogs started living with humans before uh, the advent of agriculture, that is, before humans started living in cities. But regardless, they are the, the first species to live with humans. And as such, uh, not only has their evolution been affected by living with humans, uh, it's also very likely that they've affected human evolution. And the reason I say that is because the humans who took in the dogs had certain, um, shall we say, social characteristics that allowed them to take in dogs, or at that time they would have been wolves, and live with them. And so it's, it's highly likely, indeed I think very likely, that there were characteristics of those people that allowed them uh, to survive and possibly reproduce in ways, uh, in, in a way that was uh, more adaptive than their counterparts who did not take in dogs. So in that sense, you can say we're co-evolved with dogs. Um, so when we look at dogs and how their, their brains work, in, in some sense, it's a window back in time into that, that era that not only tells us about how dogs think, but in some ways reflects back upon us the, the traits that, that we're mutually selected for. And so it's kind of a, it's almost an anthropological or archeological study in that sense. Um, in a more contemporary vein though, as you can see these pictures here, um, Dogs are interwoven into modern uh, society in many ways, and so there's intense interest in terms of how to best communicate with them. What exactly do they understand about us, and then how can we use that information to better communicate with them um, so that both humans and dogs benefit from that? And then kind of finally, I, it's if, if, if you just cruise YouTube or anywhere on the internet for cute dog pictures, you'll see kind of innumerable examples like that. And inevitably, when you see multiple species involved, um, dogs are usually the culprit. And there's, there's something um, hypersocial about the dogs um, that allow them to live with us, but also easily bond with other species as well. So there's something very interesting uh, for, for all these reasons. Now, philosophically, there are also other interesting reasons. So um, 
even though I think we're, we're beyond this, uh, beyond the Cartesian view of, of animal thought, I, I do raise this um, because, of course, Descartes you know, did not think that animals really had, were, were really thinking creatures at all. He viewed them as somewhat like automatons, um, as a very complex uh, network of reflexes, but essentially without thought, soul, or emotion. Um, that, of course, uh, began to change with Darwin, who really laid uh, the modern uh, foundations for thinking about the spectrum of cognitive thought and emotion uh, from humans um, through all the animals, really. And as he pointed out, that human emotions, human thought didn't just arise out of nothing. They, they had to have some continuity with um, similar processes that can be seen uh, throughout the animal kingdom, especially mammals. I will focus on mammals. And, Darwin, of course, used dogs um, in his writings as, as uh, quite frequently, as you can see here. This is from the expression of, of emotions in man and animal, um, pointing out that, they, that dogs displayed many characteristics similar and analogously to human emotions. Um, that fell by the wayside for roughly 100 years, um, and then only, I would say, probably in the last 50 or so years has, has that theme been taken up seriously, again, by researchers and academics um, as, as, a, as a serious line of inquiry. Although, I will say, um, you know, now having worked in this area for about seven years and, and publishing and trying to publish papers on the topic, it is not universally accepted amongst academics. Um, that, that there is a continuity between non-human and human emotions. Um, so I hope to disavow you of that thought uh, entirely. Um, so that brings us to my favorite modern philosopher, Gary Larson, who used to draw the, the Far Side cartoons. Um, so this, I can't remember when he, he drew this. This is probably about 30, 40 years ago. I think he very accurately captured part of the problem in studying animal emotions specifically. So he has here a picture of an iris setter. Um, I don't see many iris setters anymore, uh, but you can replace that with golden retriever or lab and it works just as well. Uh, so here's the problem. How do you know what an animal like this dog is feeling if they're feeling anything at all? And the, and the challenge is, is because they're, they're outward, um, expressions of their emotions may not look like ours. They may not have the same range as ours. Um, and so it becomes very problematic for us to interpret what is going on inside their heads just from their expressions and just from their behaviors, even though that is the foundation of behaviorism, using behavior to intuit what's going on inside an, an animal's head. Uh, but this is why I'm trying to bypass these constraints of behaviorism by going directly to the dog's brain and trying to interrogate it without kind of this outward um, fluff, if you will. Now, I do put this slide in because um, it's not all a uh, rosy picture in terms of dogs. I mean, there, there are significant problems uh, with dogs, uh, particularly with dog bites. Um, it is, it is a significant public health risk. Um, uh, certainly in the US, uh, there are, you know, depending on who you believe, there could be millions of dog bites per year. Children in particular are at risk. Um, and then in certain parts of the, the world, rabies is still endemic and dogs are the primary vector for that. Um, and there, there is actually quite an enormous dog population in the world. It's, nobody knows exactly how many dogs are out there, but uh, the WHO estimates that it's about 10% of the human population. So that puts it around 700 million dogs um, on the planet, um, which are a lot of dogs. So uh, for these reasons too, uh, my view is that it, the more we know about how dogs think, what's going on inside uh, their heads, um, and how better to communicate with them, the better off we'll all be. Okay, so that's that's all of my preamble and background to this. So that brings me to the role of animals in neuroscience. Now, historically, 
the predominant models, uh, we call them models, um, I don't like that term, but that's what, what biologists use. Um, the usual animals are rats and mice, and then non-human primates like monkeys. Um, so where do dogs fit into this picture? Well, historically they haven't because scientists, particularly biologists, have been reluctant to use other animals to study uh, cognitive processes, which brings us back to this term model, which I don't like. Most, the vast majority of biomedical research that uses animals are using animals as a model for humans with the primary goal of understanding something about human health, but using animals in a way that you, that that essentially doesn't allow uh, the same thing to be done in humans. So this is usually terminal for the animals, so the animals almost always die at the end of those experiments. Um, so my view of this is, is uh, well, I, I don't necessarily agree with that in, in most cases, but we have a very willing subject who lives with us every day, and they will participate in these activities voluntarily, they will do it, they will enjoy it, and we don't have to hurt them to do it. Um, so everything I'm going to show you um, is done with this in mind, where the dogs are treated as voluntary participants, and we teach them how to do it, but they always have the right to refuse to participate, as I'll, as I'll show you. So this is where we bring in the heavy equipment. So this is uh, a three Tesla MRI being installed in our psychology building. So now I want to get to the, the philosophy of, of the training that we did. So when I started this project, I had very clear ethical principles in mind that uh, are quite different than is typical in biomedical research. So in the United States, all animal research is governed by the Animal Welfare Act, um, which actually uh, is a bit of a misnomer because it only minimally protects the welfare of the animals. Um, so, so the way I set up this project goes far beyond the requirements of that law. So the first item is that we're not going to hurt the animals. Uh, this was above and beyond everything else. Uh, my dog, as well as all the other participants, are essentially treated as family members by the homes that they live with. So um, we're not going to do anything to hurt the dogs. We're not going to use any restraints. So we're not going to use chemical restraints, we're not going to sedate or anesthetize the dogs, and we're not going to use any physical restraints. So as you'll see, the dogs are completely free, and I'm going, I'm going to show you several videos on how we train the dogs and what it looks like, but as you'll see, um, it's, it's really quite voluntary. We use positive reinforcement, so of course the dogs don't know what to do initially, but we can teach them uh, using things like praise and play and food, things that they like and we're going to use community dogs. So these are all dogs who are kept as pets. We don't purchase dogs um, as, as lab animals uh, like beagles. So it is very much a citizen science project. Now, there are significant challenges to doing this. Uh, so anytime you have someone in an MRI, the first and foremost constraint is you can't move. So if you've participated in, in these types of experiments or you've had an MRI, you know the first thing they tell you is don't move, right? And the degree of immobility required is fairly substantial. So we can tolerate motion of about one to two millimeters, but beyond that leads to, to various signal artifacts that renders the data uh, unusable. So that's a fairly high bar to teach a dog um, to do, but I'll show you how we're going to do it. Um, the challenges for the dogs are a little bit different. Um, it's a novel environment, so humans typically don't like MRI scanners, but for different reasons. But novelty is not the main one. But with dogs, it can be. So uh, they are being introduced into an environment that, that, that is foreign to them, and that can be quite anxiety provoking. So part of the training process is geared towards um, alleviating that novelty and familiarizing them with the setup as well as walkthroughs at the scanner before we actually do real experiments. It's an enclosed space. This typically bothers people. Uh, uh, humans tend to get claustrophobic. This does not tend to be a problem for dogs, however. It's elevated, though. 
this doesn't usually bother people, but it can bother dogs. So what we are doing is we are teaching them to walk onto an elevated table, probably about that high, and so they have to get used to that. And of course, the scanner is very loud, and that bothers everyone. So we have to acclimate the dogs to the sound. We have to also teach them to wear ear protection, just like humans. Okay, so these were our first two participants back in 2011. Uh, Callie is my dog. Uh, she is a little terrier that was adopted from the Humane Society. Mackenzie uh, is a border collie, and um, these were our, our first two participants. So I'm going to show you uh, a five-minute video. This is our training video. Um, I will narrate as we go, but this is good. Basically, how we started. This was filmed from day one. So this is Mark Spivak. He's the dog trainer I, I work with, and that's Callie. So this is a mock-up of what we call the head coil. It's the, it's the apparatus that will pick up the signals from her brain. This is just a, a wood replica of it that I built. So he's using clicker training. So the clicker just denotes when she approximates the position that we want her in, and then she gets a treat. Here's Mackenzie. So Callie really has no s skill. She just came from the shelter and she was not a particularly well-trained dog. Uh, Mackenzie actually was uh, already trained in agility and as you'll see, this is quite easy for her. So as, as I was filming this, this was really just to document what we were doing. I had no idea whether it would work until I saw this. And this was really after only about 10 or 15 minutes of playing around with this contraption. So when I saw Mackenzie do this, then I knew we were on to something. She's still moving too much, but the intensity is quite typical of a border collie. But I knew we, we could figure out how to do this. So the next thing that we did was we started playing around with, with chin rest because the dogs needed something to put their head on and give them feedback of where to hold it. So this, this was our first attempt. Perfect, excellent, perfect job. The, the other thing you can see in this picture is Mackenzie is inside a tube. So we, we had the big tube uh, that we attached to a table to simulate the bore of the MRI. This is probably after a few weeks of playing around with this. Uh, that noise is a recording of the actual scanner. So I started playing this at home when I did this. I also played it at other times when I was playing with Callie just to get her used to it and try to have positive associations with that sound. Perfect, that's it, that's what we want. Okay, so this is probably after a month or two. This is at the real MRI. You also notice the steps, so I've taught her to walk up the steps onto the patient table. This was something we practiced at home. She's still not quite sure she wants to do this. Excellent. 
On the second trial, Kelly went right up the stairs. Okay, so this is, I'd say this is probably about after two to three months of, of practicing and trying various modifications. You'll see that I changed the chin rest, so it now conforms um, to her muzzle. It gives her good feedback in, in, most, in all directions. She's also wearing some little earmuffs. Uh, that took a bit of doing to get her to wear them, but it's necessary to muffle the sound from the scanner. And then finally, I've introduced some hand signals. Um, so one hand signal means uh, treat, and that, this hand signal means no treat. So that's basically it. And so that's more or less how we still do it, but that's how you train a dog for an MRI. Um, it looks easy, and, and in hindsight, it actually was not as difficult as you might think. It was just a lot of trial and error to get to that point. Um, but that is basically how we still do it, and we use this, this training video to show other um, owners of the dogs how we're going to do it. And I should say, you know, we started with two dogs. We just last week... Uh, Tra uh, completed training and the first MRI of the 100th dog in the project. So we've now trained and scanned 100 dogs, uh, which is amazing. Um, now, sorry. So just to show you a more contemporary video, I filmed this. This is of a different dog. This I filmed uh, a few months ago, um, just to show you what another dog looks like. Looks easy, huh? This, it's actually quite deceptive when people come and visit or uh, media comes and films us. We always pick the best dogs, of course, so it really does look easy like that, um, which is a little bit misleading because actually there is a fair amount of work that the owners put in to training their dogs to do this. Um, but it's not as hard as you might think. And then here, here's the same dog with the scanner running. And, and that's the owner holding up some cues to the dogs. So that's what it looks like, uh, very simple. So we just have some, I call these the cheesecake shots, just various pictures of, of the process. So that was Callie. Um, the other thing that, that we frequently do, you didn't see it in that last dog, but we usually uh, wrap their heads in vet wrap just to keep the ear protection in place. Some dogs prefer the earmuffs. Uh, most of the dogs, we actually use earplugs, the same ones that we use for humans, just because uh, they're more effective. Uh, this is what it looks like from the other end. That's a different dog. That dog's name is Zen. And then this is really what we're aiming for. Um, happy people, happy dogs. That dog is, uh, her name is Katie. You'll see her in some other videos a little bit later. And then. So after the first two dogs, we put word of mouth out that you know we're starting this project. Uh, if you want to volunteer, we'll teach you how to train your dog for an MRI, and we will boldly go where uh, no one has gone before. So uh, the first group of dogs, including Callie and Mackenzie, uh, we called the A team. Um, some of these dogs, uh, uh, the top one is Kaylin, and that's Katie again, are still participating in the project. Um, and then we just basically, every six months or so, we would start a new group. Uh, so we hold MRI training class. Uh, we still do it, not as frequently, but when we're running classes, we'll hold MRI training class every other Sunday. And so people will come in. Now we hold tryouts because we've gotten more selective. Uh, but the idea is, is uh, people come in just like a dog training class and we're teaching them the skill and then they take uh, the mock-ups home and practice. So this was the second group, this we called Bravo Company, and then it just kind of went on from there, just lots and lots of different dogs, uh, different groups, Charlie, Delta, Echo. The last group we finished we called Hotel because that's the eighth group um, we trained. 
And so, as I said, we've now done 100 dogs. Okay, so that's, that's the training bit. Uh, so now I get to the results and some of the science. Uh, but before we do that, I do have to say something about brain anatomy. So I put this slide up. This is not to scale. The dog's brain, um, depending on the size of the dog, is quite a bit smaller. So uh, a typical sized dog, a medium sized dog's brain is about the size of a lemon. So most of their head is not brain. Unlike ours, most of our head is filled with brain. Most of the dog's head is filled with muscle and air. Uh, their brain is, is occupying a pretty small portion of that, that big noggin. Um, so just keep that in mind. But one of the things that, the, several things we can note is that there is a lot of similarity between the structures of, of canine brains and, and human brains. So you can immediately see parallels here. You can see, um, I don't know if I have a, I don't think I have a pointer, um, but uh, you can see the, the brain stem, uh, and spinal cord going down the human. In the dog, it's there as well. It's, it's laid out more horizontally. And then sitting above that is the cerebellum, same in the human. Uh, you can see the corpus callosum is that C-shaped structure, that dark C-shaped structure. It's also there in the dog. It's uh, thinner. Um, but by and large, the main differences between the dog and the human brain are first in the, the overall size as well as the amount of folding that occurs, or gyrification. So you can, you can see that the human brain is folded quite a bit. It's not as folded in the dog, dog brain, which means that there's less surface area, both in, in an absolute sense and a relative sense. Now, that alone is not terribly important or interesting because we know that brain size is largely dictated by body size. Um, there's a very close scaling relationship between body size and brain size. Um, dogs are a little bit above average uh, when you look at that across the, the mammals. Now, there are some differences. So the olfactory uh, circuit in the dog is quite prominent, uh, and it's not so prominent in humans. So the structure at the very front of the brain there, that kind of little um, bean-shaped thing, is the olfactory bulb. So it's quite large in a dog. Uh, you can't even see it in the human brain here. So we know that there are uh, differences like that. This is a different view. This is a horizontal view, but same idea. The arrow is pointing to a structure called the caudate nucleus. And this structure is particularly important in our studies. Um, in part, that's where most of my, my background is in. That's the structure I studied in humans. It's closely related to reward processing, uh, decision-making, value-based decision-making, and it's, and it's essentially uh, the, the intersection between the motor system and um, the, the value system, if you will. It's, it's how we think that that structure biases us to make various complex decisions. So the important thing is that dogs, like all mammals, have that structure and we can identify it very clearly. And so that is where we begin our investigations into how the dog's brain works because we have to start with things that we already know something about to verify that the technique works. So what you saw me doing in that video with the hand signals was actually the first experiment that we did. So it's, it's nothing more complicated than Pavlovian conditioning. All we did was just, you know, we're not using lights and bells, but we're using a hand signal. This means food. This means no food. Very simple. The reason we did that is because that structure, the caudate nucleus, is already known to be critically involved in that type of associative learning. So that was the first thing that we did to make sure that we could get MRI signals um, that made any sense to us. And indeed, when we compare the signal, uh, the, the brain response to this signal versus this signal, um, which looks like this, reward signal, no reward signal, we are able to identify activity in that caudate nucleus uh, that looks like this. So uh, just very quickly, I'm going to show you many pictures that look like that on the left. Uh, so what that is is an is a, is a image of the dog's brain horizontal slice. And then overlaid on that, the color spots, is actually a very shorthand way of conveying the statistical significance of the activity. So we call these statistical parametric maps. Um, 
you have to think of it as, as uh, basically a t-test at every point in the brain. So what we're doing is we're comparing the activity to these two hand signals, this versus this, and then any location that has a significant difference in activation is then colored um, in, in one of those colors. Usually uh, redder means more significant. The plot on the, the right is a time uh, course of that. So uh, the x-axis is the scan after the signal onset. So the scans are occurring about every 1.4 seconds, I believe, in that experiment. And then the y-axis is the percent signal change in that location. And so the solid line represents this hand signal and the dashed line represents this signal. And so you can see that there is a, a significant increase um, at around the second and third scan, um, or the second and third time point following the signal onset. And so that is kind of the fingerprint for, for brain activity. So when, I, when I'm talking about brain activity, I'm being a little bit loose with, with the term. Technically, we're measuring um, the change in blood oxygenation, um, which is related both to the level of oxygen in, in the blood as well as the local blood flow. So what we know now after 30 or so years of fMRI is that when there's neural activity, most likely synaptic activity, uh, there's, a, there's a messenger released. Um, it's probably carbon monoxide or ni nitric oxide that then diffuses to the local blood vessels, causes them to dilate, and then you get a, an influx of fresh blood into that area on a very local level. And it's that blood flow change that we measure with fMRI. It's not neural activity directly. The reason I tell you this is because that actually forms a significant constraint in how we do experiments. Because the blood flow is actually an indirect measure, it's also slow. So as you can see from that graph where it peaks in time is two to three scans after the signal onset, which is actually about four seconds after we gave the signal. And this is very typical of fMRI studies. It's, it's a sluggish response because we're measuring the diffusion of that, uh, that signal and then we have to wait for the blood vessels to expand and that takes about four seconds. So all the experiments have to be designed with that time lag in mind. So everything I'm going to show you from now on factors that in. Okay, so I'm not going to show you that graph anymore. Um, we just build it into the analysis. Now, one of the things that we did after Callie McKenzie and we started getting more dogs was we just did the same thing in more dogs. Because, um, you know, two subjects is great. Uh, it's, it's not unheard of when you're using um, animals like this, but you can't very well build a, a research program on two animals. Um, so once we started recruiting and training other dogs, we scaled up. Here's the same experiment now in 12 dogs. And what I'm showing you here is the average result for 12 dogs. Uh, that takes a, a fair bit of, of image manipulation because as I said, dogs um, come in different sizes, their brains are different sizes, so you have to digitally warp them um, into what we call an atlas, uh, what you sh uh, which is what I'm showing you here. So the different views here, in A, it's again a horizontal slice. The colors simply denote the, the level of significant activity change for those two hand signals. And the reason I, sh I show this is just to point out that it's very localized. So those red hot spots are in the caudate nucleus and really nowhere else. Um, the other two views are views front on, so it's like a slice right uh, that way. And again, it kind of looks like uh, headlights. Again, it's, it's a signature for the reward system of the brain. And then the, the final image is, is what we call thresholding it. It's just taking away all the stuff that's not significant and you're just left with, with the activity there. So that's great. That gives us confidence that the technique works. Uh, it gives us results uh, that we can interpret. Um, it's not terribly exciting, as many of my colleagues you know, told me. It's like, great, you discovered dogs like hot dogs. Big deal. Um, but that wasn't the point, right? Uh, the point was to demonstrate first that the technique works, and then we can go on from there to do more interesting things. So one of the things that we did after that was we asked the question, well, does it matter what the source of those signals 
is. Uh, if it's just Pavlovian conditioning, it really shouldn't matter whether I give the signals or whether some random person off the street gives the signals or whether even a computer gives the signals. So that was what we did next. So we, we basically did the same experiment. You can see a dog in our simulator there uh, looking at a computer screen showing cartoon versions of the same hand signals. And then you can see the dog in the scanner seeing the hand signal. Okay, well, like all things, these things turn out to be more complex than you anticipate. Uh, so it turned out that it made a difference and the way it made a difference was not the same for all dogs. Uh, so this is again with 12 dogs. And the, th the thing that we found that made a difference was based on the dog's temperament. So there are a number of ways you can measure dog's temperament or personality. The one that we've used, which has the most data, is something called the CBARC, C-B-A-R-Q, which is the Canine Behavioral Assessment and Research Questionnaire. It's essentially a personality inventory for dogs that the owners fill out. And it's about 50 questions or so, and uh, you simply just enter it into the website, um, and then it, it spits back, I think, 14 dimensions of canine personality. It's fairly well validated um, in the sense that it's been done in about 50,000 dogs, so there's, there's a, a, a fairly well-known distribution of what constitutes um, normality, depends on the breed. But the thing that we found out that was very interesting was that the thing that distinguished uh, the dogs from each other in our group was how aggressive they were. So several of the questions in, in that inventory relate to a dog's um, aggressive tendencies, whether it's towards people or other dogs. And what we found was that dogs who were very low in aggression had one pattern, um, this, this pattern here, uh, which shows that there was a significant difference to the reward signal versus the no reward signal, but only when those signals were given by their person, their owner as opposed to the other group, which is labeled high aggression, uh, which, by the way, my dog is in that category. Um, she's a terrier. Uh, she's extremely aggressive at other small animals. Um, that's, I think, largely genetic. Uh, those dogs actually showed the opposite pattern. So you can see uh, from that plot that, that the two categories that distinguished each other were the unfamiliar human and the computer, but not the familiar human. So it was very strange. These dogs who score high in aggression seemed to pay more attention to what was going on when it was a, a novel source of information. So that was our, our first clue that there was something interesting going on here and kind of also set me down the path of studying not only how dogs think, but what um, essentially makes them individuals as well. So, so that aspect of individuality is also something that um, continues to be of great interest to me. Because oftentimes when you, when you see findings about dogs in the literature or the popular press, it's kind of, it's always billed as this kind of general finding that dogs do X, right? Uh, with very little discussion about the variation of dogs amongst themselves. Okay, so that result actually led to a spin-off project, uh, which we did with Canine Companions for Independence, which is probably the largest or one of the largest groups in North America that trains dogs to become service dogs or assistance animals. And so the idea was, okay, well, if we could identify dogs that had a particular profile of activity, specifically that first one I showed you for the low aggressive dogs, could we use that to predict whether they would become a good service dog? And so we integrated uh, the training, so this is uh, one of their dogs in a simulator that we built in California uh, where they're headquartered. So we integrated the MRI training into the dog's assistance training. It turned out to be very easy for those dogs because the things that those dogs were being trained to do are much more complicated than simply laying down in a loud scanner. Uh, so for those dogs and, and with those trainers, it really only took probably a month to train these dogs, and, and those dogs were actually adolescents. So the way CCI works is the puppies are raised by puppy raisers, 
they return to their training centers when they're about 15 months old and then they complete so-called advanced training. And if they graduate, they're matched with a human. And if, and if they just, if they can't do the job or they can't do it well enough, then they're usually um, released back to the puppy raisers and then adopted as pets. Um, so what we were trying to do was essentially do the MRI uh, task, which I just showed you, and then wait and see what happens to the dogs and then see if the brain activity then predicts the outcome. Um, so just real quick, the, the design demographics, there were 50 dogs that we recruited between 2014 and 2015. Uh, we did this in cohorts of six to 10 dogs every three months. The MRI training, um, two to three months, but it was actually probably a bit less than that. And then uh, I would fly out to Berkeley every three months with the team and we would do the scanning there. And then they would continue the assistance training for another three to six months and then we uh, recorded their outcome. Um, two were released for medical reasons, four became breeders, and one didn't complete the scan. So, so that left us with 43 dogs. These are all golden retrievers or labs or mostly mixes of the two. This is what it looks like. Uh, that's not even all of them. That's just all the ones I can fit in one slide. Uh, and those are all the, the MRI dogs um, at, at Berkeley Scanner, which is the same one we have. And it's really quite remarkable to look at it. Uh, they they kind of look like clones, and they kind of are um, based on their their breeding lines. Um, but what's amazing is not all of them become service dogs. They not, not all of them were able to complete the training. 49 out of 50 were able to complete the MRI training, though. And so what we were able to do is actually develop a fairly sophisticated model based on activity in, in three distinct areas. One is the caudate, which I talked about. Uh, the second one is the amygdala, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And then the third area, which is DFA, we call that dog face area. I'll tell you about that more in a minute, but that's basically part of the visual system associated with face processing. We ended up being able to make this kind of model which focused primarily on the activity in the caudate as well as the interaction of the, of the amygdala and visual system activity. And that model was able to predict the outcome of these dogs uh, in terms of service dog training. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to go into all the, the nitty gritty details, um, but it's kind of standard approach these days in what we call machine learning. And so this is, this is what's called an ROC curve. Um, it plots the true positive rate of the model versus the false positive rate. So anytime you see these sorts of things, you always kind of want to look for this because any, anyone can claim uh, their machine learning or their AI model can predict all the outcomes. But what you also want to know is how many times did it falsely predict the same thing. So that's, that's why true positives and false positives are, are important. And a good model will be kind of high up into the left corner of this type of plot um, where it will have a high true positive rate with a low false positive rate. This is fairly moderate. Um, it's not super great, but it's not random either. Um, and it's, it's about kind of what you would expect best case for something as complicated as, a be as becoming a service dog from one uh, brain measure. So the fact that it works at all was quite significant. And what's also important about the finding is that it tells us that there is activity going on in the dog's brain in these structures, um, which you have, no, you have no way of measuring kind of from the outside because the dog is doing what we've asked them to do, which is lay still in the scanner and just watch these hand signals. There's nothing from their outward appearance that, that would suggest that they're bothered by it or even that they feel anything at all. But the fact is their brains are telling us they do care about it, they are, feeling something. We think it's related to the level of excitement. Um, perhaps some anxiety is indexed by the amygdala um, because the amygdala activity is, it was actually the key player. And in this experiment, more amygdala activity was not better. It was actually a negative relationship. So the dogs who kind of had the most reactive amygdala were the dogs who did not become service dogs. So there's something about that structure. We think it's related to arousal um, that in that group uh, is, is basically not a good indicator for becoming a service dog, as, as you might expect. Um, dogs who are easily aroused are not good assistance animals. Okay, 
So more studies. Um, we've done. Uh, I'm sure, I'm doing it on time. Uh, when do you want me to stop? <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing fine. Okay. What I suggest is that you allow people to ask you questions while you're talking. Okay, you heard it. <laughs> I'm not going to wait. Okay. Yes. So you can look at it in real time. My question is, if you compared your model predictions with CBARC predictions and with human judgment, how did it do? Excellent question. So that was actually in the paper. I didn't put it in the slide, but since you asked. So, so it's actually critically important. Um, well, the result was interesting in and of itself, but to be practical in any kind of useful way, it really needs to be better than anything that doesn't require MRI training. So um, the sea bark by itself in that population is worthless because um, they kind of, they're all basically floored out on most of the, the kind of obvious measures. That population of dogs scores zero on all the negative traits. Um, it's been bred out of them. Um, they're the most placid, most docile dogs you'll ever meet. Um, so that's of no use. Um, Internally, though, CCI has developed many kind of their own behavioral metrics, which they routinely use, and that's basically how they make their own decisions on whether a dog progresses or not. So that's, the, that's actually the key comparison. And they actually do um, fairly well. Uh, so we ran their metrics through the same type of model. Um, and their, when we do that, their curve is a, li is a little bit under that. So it's a little bit closer to the diagonal. So it's still reasonable, but this one's a little bit better. Um, then you run into kind of cost-benefit analyses. And so you have to ask, is it better enough to bother with all the extra training or, or in the expense of the MRI? And the answer to that's a little more complicated. Maybe yes, maybe no. It might be worth it um, on a kind of a large scale like they operate, but um, it's of probably of marginal benefit. So, all right, moving on. Um, is there a question back there? Okay, make it brief and, I'll re and I will repeat the question. How about that? So, so the question was, um, did we find a correlation between level of aggressivity and the length of time it took to train the dogs? Um, we haven't specifically run that correlation, um, but my, my gut feeling is they're uncorrelated. Um, the things, the things the, these are orthogonal traits, because um, some of the, the most, some of the more aggressive dogs in our project, and, and by and large, the dogs are all very good dogs, um, but some of them are, do have aggressive tendencies. As I said, my dog you know, kills small animals. Um, we have a couple of other dogs who have bit people. Um, so the reasons that they do that are multifactorial. Um, they may do it out of fear, probably is, is the more likely explanation in most cases, but like I said, it's orthogonal to their ability to learn these tasks, and it's also dictated by the humans doing the training. So probably the, one of the, the equal variables in how quickly the dogs learn is how good a dog trainer is the person doing the trainer, and people vary widely in that. The floodgates are opened. I have a question. 
question about uh, the indiv individuality of the animals. Like how, because you have such a small sample, how can you separate like individuality versus like species uh, traits from species like bulldogs or the whatever? breed? Yeah. So yeah. the question about breed breed specific traits versus um, something else. Yeah. Um, we can't. Um, it's it's extremely complicated. I mean, there there are over a hundred different recognized dog breeds. Um, now, the, it, it's very controversial, honestly, um, the relationship of breed to personality. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that you can only get with extremely large sample numbers. You know, you need tens of thousands. And that only recently have people been doing that. Um, and even in those studies, there's still tremendous variability within breeds. Um, and that doesn't even address the question of what constitutes a breed in the first place, because breed has historically been uh, defined based on physical characteristics, physical morphology. Um, and now in the age of genetics, uh, if, if, you, if you do a cheek swab of your dog and you send it in, you, you will probably be surprised what comes back. Um, it's often not what you think it is. So I would say even the notion of breed is quite blurry these days. Thank you. All right, so back to, back to the uh, study. So we also did a study of odors. Uh, this was one of our early studies. So the idea was similar to the, to the hand signals where instead of now you, uh, varying who gives the hand signals, we simply present the smell of different um, of, uh, significant entities in the dog's world. And that includes the smell of a familiar human, someone who lives in the house, uh, a strange human that they've never met, a familiar dog, strange dog, and their own um, scent. So in case you're wondering where these scents came from, uh, the human odors were uh, uh, acquired by underarm wipings and the dog uh, odors were butt wipings. Uh, I can't say it um, any more clearly <laughs> than that. Um, uh, this is a job of a grad student. Um, so we simply took those uh, cotton swabs um, and then presented them to the dog in the scanner and just registered the response. Um, it's a little, it was a little bit noisy, but the basic result was this. Um, so again, same type of map. Um, the olfactory cortex and bulb was activated to all the odors that we presented. So that's on, on the left, that hot spot and the crosshairs. And then on the right, the caudate, where, which is where the, the crosshairs are there, it was a bit of a weaker signal but that was only activated to the scent of the familiar human. That was a bit of a surprise to us. It wasn't the scent of a familiar dog, as one might expect from the scent of a conspecific, but it was actually the human. Um, so there could be several explanations for that. It could be just because, if you want to uh, be cynically objective about it, just because the person feeds the dog and that's what's most rewarding to them. Or it could be representing some kind of um, deeper social bond that they have with that person. I'll come back to that. One of the things that we did after that was uh, we asked the question about face processing. So this is intensely interesting to those in the dog world, which is the extent to, the, uh, to which dogs might process human faces and beyond that, uh, expressions on human faces. So when we started this, it really wasn't known whether there was a specific area of the dog's brain dedicated to face processing. So in humans and all other primates, there is a whole circuit um, in basically the temporal lobe that is, seems to be dedicated to processing faces. And the usual way that you demonstrate this, and, and this study is just drawn from the human literature, is you show pictures of faces to the person in the scanner, and you contrast that with pictures to other things like objects, everyday objects, pic pictures of natural scenes, as well as scrambled images. And so that's what you see here along the bottom. So we did this. These pictures come from a human experiment. We didn't even have to make these up. So we're now kind of moving along in, in the dog project where the dogs are just getting better and better at doing these scans, and they stay in the, scan, in the scanner longer and longer to the point where now we just, we basically just steal human experiments and adapt them for dogs now. Um, so this was one of the first ones that we did. And so that, those stimuli come from human experiments. 
And, and what we did was we actually did this experiment twice because reviewers didn't believe the results the first time, so we just repeated it. Uh, what we did was we showed both movies and black and white pictures. So the, the one that says dynamic, those are, those are um, just single frames from actually three second dynamic clips, so they're actually moving around. Um, and then we contrasted, we made a contrast between the faces and the objects to identify the part of the visual system and temporal lobe that preferentially responded to the faces over the objects and then repeated the experiment with, with black and white static images to confirm that that area also activated to black and white pictures over objects, okay? So what we get is this. So here, uh, the dots actually are not levels of activity. They represent individual dogs, uh, the location of those spots um, in the dog's brain. So as is typical with the human literature, when you do this, um, these face processing regions are broadly in the temporal lobe, although the exact location varies from individual to individual. So we use the movies as what we call a dynamic localizer to identify the spot in each dog's brain, and then repeated the experiment with the static images, which is what gives you the bar plots on the, on the left, uh, sorry, on the right. Now there's two broad profiles. The one on the bottom, which is labeled V1, has the profile that all stimuli are, activate that region. And that is exactly what you'd expect from primary visual cortex. It's just responding to stuff stimulating the retina. In contrast, the face area, which we call DFA for dog face area, had the profile that only the faces activated that region, especially relative to objects. And that is exactly the profile you see in humans and every other primate. And so that was really the first demonstration that dogs also have a face processing area. Uh, what, the one thing I'll say about that experiment, that was actually a fairly difficult experiment to teach the dogs to do, and not all the dogs would do it. Um, so while the dogs had gotten very good at staying in the scanner, most of them really wanted to be looking at their human. So that experiment required replacing their human with a screen um, and projecting images on it. So not all the dogs would do that. Yes? Sorry, were those the question was, were those conspecifics or human? Uh, both. So we had both human faces and dog faces. And no, we, we didn't see a significant activation difference between those two. But again, it was a fairly small sample size. Okay, moving on. This is actually some of our latest work, which is not published yet. Um, but kind of, again, moving along in complexity, we have this question about human language. Everyone wants to know dogs understand what we're saying to them. Um, every dog owner out there swears up and down their dog knows what they're saying. Uh, so we come back again to Gary Larson, the philosopher, who quite succinctly captured what he thought was going on. Um, and in the business, we call this the ginger effect. Um, so it's quite, I will say this is quite challenging to study. Um, but here's, here's how we approached it. Okay. Uh, what we did was we taught the dogs the names of two objects, two new objects that we introduced. Here's, here's what they look like. Um, so these are, these are the dogs with their toys. And these are new toys for them. Uh, they hadn't seen these before. And the idea was to teach the dog the names of these things. So we just gave them arbitrary names, or, or their owners gave them arbitrary names. Um, so I don't know. So Katie might have... I don't know what that is, uh, monkey and, and yellow. So the objects were, were designed to be as, as different as possible. And then they had to learn on the command of saying the name of that object to either go retrieve it or at least knows the correct one. Um, sounds easy, right? Uh, have you all heard of the dog Chaser, the dog who knows a thousand words? So. Um, we used the chaser protocol, um, which is, is well described. Um, but unlike chaser, well, none of these dogs were like chaser. Um, we thought uh, if chaser could learn a thousand words, we thought that two would be easy. And it really wasn't. Um, it took six months um, for these dogs to get to an 80% performance criterion on this task. Um, it was extremely frustrating for the owners. 
Um, maybe talk later about why, why the difference, um, but, but it did. It just took a long time. Um, once, once they got to that performance criteria, then we brought them to the scanner for this experiment. And the idea was the, the owner would stand in front of the scanner and the dog like that, and then speak the words very loudly five times. So they'd say, monkey, monkey, monkey. And so then we just register the, the dog's brain response to those words. And then after they said the word, they would hold up the object. Sometimes they would hold up a novel object following the word. And then as a control condition, they also spoke pseudo words. So this, this comes from the human language literature. So a pseudo word is, it sounds like a real word. It's made up of the same phonemes um, that constitute the words that we used, but it's not a real word. Um, uh, and so that was the control condition. So the dogs had never heard that before. Okay, and then we contrast that. So same idea. Um, and much to our surprise, what we found was when, when we contrasted these, it wasn't actually the trained words that elicited more activity in the dog's brain. It was the pseudo words. It was the things they'd never heard before. Um, part of this, we think, is what we call an oddball effect um, because uh, the pseudo words weren't as frequent as the trained words as well as being novel. What we think is, is that it shows that the dogs can at least recognize and discriminate things that they have heard before from those that they haven't. And that seems to trigger kind of a cascade response in terms of potent, not, I don't want to call it language processing, we'll call it auditory processing because we don't yet know whether the dogs treat the words as symbolic representations for the things. That's what we, what we all want to know, but we're not quite there yet. But we can at least demonstrate that the pseudo words um, are discriminated from the trained words in auditory areas um, like the auditory cortex. We can go a little bit further. Um, it, the trained words, and in hindsight, it, it's, well, it's partly a limitation of it. Um, the trained words were not significantly different from each other when we look at overall activity. Um, and then we have, to, we have to deploy fairly sophisticated machine learning algorithms to try to understand whether maybe it's, maybe it's the pattern of activity in the brain that dictates one word or another. Um, so there's some hint of that. Um, the, these are areas where we can show that the pattern of activity in that region discriminates the words. It's not at a high level. It's a little bit above chance. Um, so it's, it's significant, but it's not, you know, it's not to the point of brain decoding yet, although that's, that's where we're moving. Okay, so I know I'm running a bit out of time. I do wanna move on to hybrid tasks. And, I, and the first hybrid task um, that we did was to come back to the question I raised at the beginning, which is the default um, argument of the pure behaviorist, which is that it's all about food. And the only reason dogs do what they do is because we feed them. Okay, fine. Um, so we finally got around to doing what we call the praise versus food task. It's modeled after the original one. It's still Pavlovian um, conditioning. We ran, we're running out of hand signals, so we started substituting objects on sticks. So this is a little video I'm going to show you. Uh, there are three conditions in this experiment. One is uh, a, a hairbrush is held up on a stick. Nothing happens after that. That's the control condition. You'll see a pink car held up. After that, the owner will pop into view and say, good girl. And then the final condition is you'll see a blue horse on a stick. And after that, the dog is fed. Um, we call it the treat kebab because the, the treat comes in on a, on a stick disembodied from the human. This is, this is the dog, Katie, who you've seen before. She's our, our favorite model. That was control. So, Yay, control. Say so it's inscrutable. Can't tell what she's thinking.
Okay, so that's, that's what it looks like in the scanner as well. We do that over and over again to get lots of trials. Before, before I tell you what the result is, we also did a behavioral test outside of the scanner. I don't really like doing behavioral tests with dogs. Um, I find them very confusing. Um, and we can talk about why that is, but I'm gonna show you this one. Um, so we set up a giant V maze in our training room. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, owners seated on one side. Uh, there's a, do a little yellow dog bowl on the left with a treat in it. We familiarize the dog with the setup several times before we actually start doing this. We do this 20 times. So the dog's gonna be released from that, behind that door and then they have to make a choice. Do they go to the owner and just get praise or do they go get the food? So I will show you. This is a different dog. This dog's name is Ohana. Okay, very happy. She, she picked her over the food. But let's do it again. Okay, so fairly typical. The dogs displayed actually a wide range of, of patterns on this. And what's interesting is not only was it the proportion of choices, but what turned out to be most interesting <coughs> was the sequence of choices. And so we can analyze the sequence of choices and we can make what's called a hidden Markov model. So what we did was we, a hidden Markov model uh, essentially assumes that the dog is, is either in a food state or a praise state. And when they're in the food state, they go to the food bowl, and they're in a praise state, they go to the human. And then those arrows just denote transition probabilities, so they can either go back and forth between these states or they can stay in the same state. And you can analyze the sequence of choices to compute these probabilities. And when we did that, what we found was uh, a relationship between the activity in the dog's caudate, differentially for the expectation of praise versus food, versus the likelihood of staying in that praise state versus the food state on the behavioral task. Now what's interesting about it, um, so the x-axis is, is the differential caudate activity, so around zero means that the caudate activity was equal for praise and food. And as you see, most of the dogs are kind of vertically laid out around zero, which means that the majority of dogs just had an equal expectation or equal caudate response to food and praise. If you want to put words on it, it means they like both of them equally. Um, and then a smaller proportion were out towards the right. Those are the dogs who had higher caudate activity for praise. And then there's a couple kind of down on the left who were what we call the, the true chow hounds. Um, now what's interesting about this plot is, I mean, there is, it's, it's a, not a strong correlation, but it is statistically significant that the dogs who had higher caudate activity to praise were the dogs who tended to stick with their owner over and over on that behavioral task. And so by doing these types of studies and, and models, we're, we're beginning to build up kind of a functional map, not only of how the dog's brain works, but also linking it back to how they behave kind of in a real world environment. Um, one of our more recent ones, uh, which Stephen knows about, is, is kind of a similar approach with jealousy. Very complicated um, um, emotional construct on what that actually means. Um, but again, we were interested in this idea um, of complex emotions. So the setup of this experiment, again, we use food for this one. This is the dog's view of it. You can see a very realistic looking statue of a fake dog. And if you look closely, there's a little tube taped behind his mouth. And then on the left, you see that red thing, that's a bucket. So the owner would stand there in between those two things with the dog in the scanner. And then sometimes the owner would turn around and feed fake dog. And sometimes they would turn around and put the food in the bucket, okay? And meanwhile, the dog's in the, in the scanner. We're registering the brain response while they watch that. Now, the re the, what the bucket, control is for is, is we're not interested in whether the dog is, quote, disappointed in not getting food. Presumably they are. What we want to know is are they differentially disappointed or they have a differential response to not getting food when that realistic 
you know, facsimile of a dog is getting food. Um, and again, what we come back to is this issue of individuality. Um, it's not the case that all dogs, you know, had the same response to this. Um, we can talk, talk about this later if, if you like. Um, the short answer is, again, we come back to the dog's personality. So again, the dogs who score high on aggression, in this case specifically dog-directed aggression, were the ones who had a higher differential response to that fake dog being fed, specifically in their amygdala, okay? Um, what I think of the amygdala is it's not, it's not synonymous with any particular emotion, but it is known to be highly linked to states of arousal. Um, which can be positive or negative. We saw it in the service dog study, um, and, we, and we see it again in the jealousy study. Amygdala activity, the way I think about these dogs with aggressive tendencies is that they have what I call a twitchy amygdala. Um, for whatever reason, their amygdala is quick to respond to various things, and that is kind of a gateway, potentially a gateway towards their aggressive behavior. Now, the, the, the reason this is interesting and important is the fact that we're detecting the amygdala activity in the absence of kind of an overt behavioral response says that they are feeling things before, their behavior, before it kind of bubbles up to an overt behavior. And that provides a window for understanding uh, these emotional states as well as intervening in the case of aggressive behavior. I mean, we, we are now kind of in the position where we can use that amygdala essentially as a training signal. If we have access to it in real time, we may be able to teach the dogs not to do that um, or better understand why it's happening. Okay, the last thing I'll talk about are the active tasks. There's only one of them. As I said, it's very difficult to do a behavior in the scanner. Um, so the behavior that we chose is actually a non-behavior. So this was drawn from the human uh, development literature. It's a task of impulse control called the go, no go task. Uh, the idea is to set up um, a behavioral response, which is the go condition, which becomes kind of a default thing that you do, almost reflexive, and then introduce some other condition where you have to inhibit that response. So in this case, we used a dog whistle. I'm going to show you a little video. The dog whistle means nose poke that target, which is in front of her nose. Um, and then there's a hand signal that looks like this, which means don't poke the nose target even when you hear the whistle. Hard, very hard to train. This one also took six months. Uh, so this is what it looks like. That's just our standard control. That was the original experiment task. Okay, so that was a false alarm because she wasn't supposed to do that. That was correct. Okay, very simple looking. Although, again, quite difficult to teach a dog not to do something. Um, kind of what it looks like in the scanner. Uh, again, same idea. So those are the, the main hand signals that we're contrasting. So the dogs already know this, which means hold still and you'll get a treat versus this which means hold still even when you hear the whistle and you'll get a treat. So think of it as putting on the brakes. When we do that and we look across the brain, we find only one area involved in the differential response to those two things, and it's in the, in the prefrontal cortex. Um, what's interesting about this is this is, we think, the analogous region to what happens when you do this in a human. So if you go in the human literature and look at this task, of which there are many, many examples, you find that, that the inferior, the ventral inferior prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that becomes active when humans do this task. And so this seems to be in the corresponding analogous region. And what's even more interesting is the dogs who had more activity here were the dogs who had fewer false alarms on this task. So there seems to be a direct link that the more real estate they deploy on the task, the better they do. Makes sense. Okay. Um, those, that is the end of the functional um, program. Um, well, I think we're about out of time. What do you want me to do? I got. I could. I could do more. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, okay. So I mentioned diseases. Um, 
so at the, I, when I started this, I didn't know if it would work. I had no idea that it would become what it did, but the fact is that you know, this is all I do now. Um, and we've seen odd things in dogs' brains. Um, in the human, you, same thing happens in humans. We call them incidental findings. If you scan enough people's brains, you'll find something weird. Um, so we've seen some oddities. Uh, this is a case of hydrocephalus in, in that dog. You can tell from the way the dog looks. Um, uh, but the crosshairs are that kind of that gray area in the middle is our ventricles, so they've kind of ballooned out. Um, the dog is fine, but it was just an oddity. Uh, the dog's brain was kind of too weird looking for us, so you know, he stopped participating. Um, more concerning, though, uh, is stuff like this. Uh, so this was something uh, that we observed in a dog who'd been participating for many years, and um, the owner brought the dog in for one of our experiments and just casually remarked that Stella had a nosebleed last week. Um, so I was like, okay, well, we'll just scan her nose instead of her brain. And unfortunately, that's what we saw. Um, so any, that kind of socked in area in her nose is a nasal carcinoma. Anytime you see asymmetry in the head, it's never good. Um, but in her case, you know, and because of the owner's commitment to the dog, um, we were able to refer her to the, the, the veterinary hospital at University of Georgia, um, where she got a CT scan, they confirmed what we thought it was, and then she got radiation treatment. Um, and so, because the dog was trained for the MRI, it was, a, it was literally a trivial thing for us to follow the regression of her tumor in a way that really nobody else could do, uh, certainly not in any cost-effective way. So she would come in every two weeks. Um, we weren't even doing functional scans at that point. Um, she'd just come in, hop up on the table. It would take 30 seconds to take an image like that, and she'd be in and out in 10 minutes, and we're able to kind of track her progress and how the treatment worked. Um, that's what I've been saying. I'm working on it. Still 700 million to go. <laughs> um, other things, uh, I mean, unfortunately, you know, cancer is very common in many breeds. Um, another dog who'd participated um, uh, developed a brain tumor. He was a golden retriever. Um, he was 12 at the time. And similar story, uh, the owner called me up and said, Jack had a seizure last night. I said, okay, bring him in. Um, same, same deal. It took 10 minutes, we did a, a simple scan, that kind of hyper intensity here, um, that's, that's a tumor. Um, and we went back in time and we could actually see that it was probably there at least five months before, but not two years before. And this, you know, this is interesting. I mean, there's not much you can do in a dog that age with a brain tumor, um, but it points out that we're now in a position to potentially to detect these things before dogs become symptomatic from the diseases that typically kill them. Um, uh, so, you know, that's kind of where we're at these days. Uh, because of these dogs, we now kind of routinely, you know, do these health monitoring scans in all the dogs in the project to see, you know, if they're developing tumors. Um, because many of these dogs we know are, that's what's going to kill them. Um, certainly all, all the Goldens and Labs are probably gonna get cancer. Um, we can do body scans now. Um, here's another dog. That, that's a lipoma on the side of, of her body. That is not malignant. It's just, you know, many dogs just get these lumps um, with age. Uh, but it also shows you that we can image the internal organs. The dogs are awake. They don't know, they don't care if we're imaging their body or their head. Um, so now, that is the end. <laughs>